Welcome back, everyone, for another edition of Grace to All with Paul Gray. And if uh, you were with us last week and heard Bob Engel and I uh, visit, uh, uh, you know that you're in for a treat again today. And if you missed that, uh, don't turn it off right now. But uh, when we're done, go back and listen to that, too, because uh, you'll really enjoy it. Bob, welcome back. Good to be back. And I'm glad you're letting me wear the same shirt. You know? <laughs> yeah, me too. <laughs> yeah. It's only been a week now. And, uh, yeah, right. Uh, fortunately, so they can't. Yeah, it's a little tough, you know. Yeah, people can't smell though over the over the internet. That's a good thing. <laughs> well, as I mentioned last week, uh, Bob and I are, are friends. Uh, we we both live in Lawrence, Kansas, uh, and because of uh, uh, COVID, uh, we met right after that. Because of that, uh, we haven't met in person yet, uh, but we will uh, one of these days. But we spend a lot of time uh, online together, and we've become good friends. And Bob's part of our of our group uh, here in Lawrence that gets together every Sunday morning on Zoom. And, we're, and we have people who join us uh, starting to come now from all over the country, from California and from, uh, uh, from uh, other, uh, actually from other countries too, from Luxembourg and from uh, Ohio. And uh, I, I can't remember where all now, but uh, uh, it, it's fun getting to know more people. And uh, Bob and I and, and some others uh, from our group here in Lawrence are, uh, uh, regular contributors to that conversation, which I appreciate very much. And so without getting, uh, uh, without talking more about that, uh, we're going to talk about a, uh, a parable today. Uh, and without, I won't set it up, Bob, I'll just, uh, uh, I think I've wound you up. So uh, I'm going to let loose and let you go. Tell us what you want to talk about. <laughs> I was teaching a Sunday school class many years ago, and the, the material they gave me was a parable of the Good Samaritan. And and I taught it and it went all right. And uh, there was a young lady in that class was one of my favorite students and she was absent that day. And I, I didn't think anything about that. But the next Sunday she came in and she said, what did you teach last week? And I said, well, I, I taught the parable of the Good Samaritan. And she said, well, I'm sorry, I missed that. And I said, why don't I review it? And the Lord just exploded it in front of me. And, and it continues to explode in front of me. I, that, that's been 15 years ago. Uh, and I see it as the whole gospel. Uh, there was a man who came down from Jerusalem to Jericho, which by the way, if you'll look at the geographics there, is a 3,000 foot drop. Mm. It's 3,000 feet downhill and a pretty short distance. It's a pretty steep decline is the correct term. But he came down from Jerusalem toward Jer Jericho and he fell in with thieves there was a section of that road that was commonly known as, as, as bloody and that there were all kinds of thieves and all kinds of stuff went on there. And this guy, either we don't know whether he was victimized by him or joined him. I, we really honestly don't know anything about the man, except he fell in with thieves, things went awry, and they left him, they stripped him and left him in a ditch, presumably to die. And in the King James, it says, and a certain priest happened by and passed by, passed the other side, looked upon him and passed up by the other side. And then it says a certain Levi. Now, a priest, by the way, would represent the religious body of, of Israel. He, he would represent organized religion. Uh, and then a, a Levi. Now, Levites, if you'll study them, they were men, they weren't priests, but they were men of the church and they could keep the law. They were, they were considered very religious men. Maybe they were elders or deacons. But a Levite passed and looked upon him and, and, and he happened by and looked upon him and passed by. And then a certain Samaritan who was on a journey. And one of the things the Lord showed me early in this, the priest passed by, the Levite passed by, the Samaritan was on a journey. This is the first guy of the three that's actually going somewhere in his life. He's actually got some destination in mind, okay? And he looked upon him with compassion, it says. Now, if you put yourself in that Samaritan shoes, uh, you did an excellent job, by the way, a couple of weeks ago of talking about the position of the Samaritan and their relationship in Israel. But fundamentally, they were considered second class. They were mixed race, if you will. Uh, they were... They were, uh, they were not religiously acceptable. Uh, and in my mind, as I see it, when that, when, that, when that Samaritan looked upon this man in the ditch with compassion, 
I could almost hear the Samaritan saying, man, I know what it's like to be in a ditch. I was born in one. Mm. And what the Samaritan did was three things. He says he bound his wounds. Now, we know in that culture that what you wore was your identity. So, so I mean, if, if you were a major league priest, you had a wide hem on the bottom of your robes and so on and so forth, what you wore. And we have no reason to believe the Samaritan carried a first aid kit. I have always pictured that he actually probably tore a little piece of his robe and used it to bind the man's wounds. So he identified with the man. And then he said he gave him wine, which is he, he ministered spirit to him. You know, wine and spirits, right? Mm -hmm. And then he put him on his own beast. And a long time after I first started seeing this, I said to the Lord one day, well, I, I get the I get the significance of the of the of the binding of the wounds. I get the significance of the wine, but what's this? He put him on his own beast, and the Lord said two things to me. First of all, He said, uh, "Forgive me, but when you see somebody in the ditch, get off your ass and do something." <laughs> um, but it took me back to something Max Lucado used to talk about. He used to talk about three levels of life: survival, success, and significance. The priest represented religion, which is survival. If I'm good enough, maybe I'll make it. The Levite represented success. I'm good enough. I've made it. I'm successful. And I can see that Levite looking on that guy and say, you know what? He should have known coming down here that he could expect to have this happen to him. So he rep represented success. The Samaritan represented significance. And what the Lord showed me about the donkey was he wrapped his wounds, he, he gave him wine, and then he put him on his donkey. He said to me, if you're willing to be significant in my name, you won't have to carry the load. Yeah. yeah. And he, the Samaritan took, took this man down to an inn. And, and, and as the story says, he, he took him to the innkeeper and he said, restore this man. And, and here's money. I'm paying for this. And if it's not enough, I'll be back. Um, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll come back and make up for whatever it takes. Now, here's what we know about the Samaritan. We know he was religiously unacceptable. And we know he did the right thing. You know, Jesus went on to say, uh, uh, that, that was the answer to who is my neighbor uh, that, the, that the young lawyer had asked. And, and, and Jesus went on to say, who do you think the neighbor was here? Who was the guy that performed as the neighbor, right? Well, it was a Samaritan. We know that the Samaritan was, was religiously unacceptable. We know that the re, that Samaritan could know, we have no idea whether he had any relationship with God or not. We know he never prayed a sinner's prayer. Uh, we, we know he was probably not ever baptized. We know he didn't fit any of the qualifications that we've put on the, the requirements for eternal life. And yet, when it came down to identifying who had it right, he was the guy Jesus pointed out. I'll tell you how offensive it was to, a, to, to, the, to the religious crowd he was talking to, by the way, to, to use a Samaritan. If he, were to, if he were to use that example today in, in, in a conservative evangelical church, he wouldn't have said the Good Samaritan. He would have said the good gay Muslim, mm. a man who, the very the, the very name of him, mm. uh, would, would be offensive. And I got mm. something this morning. I was thinking about that, and somebody posted a thread, and they were struggling with, with 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 what they were seeing in Christianity and so on and so forth. And I saw the Good Samaritan, and this is a phrase that I just got this morning. It said, "What you saw was the non-religious nature." of God created man. The good Samaritan did exactly what God creates in man to do. And that is look upon each other with compassion and, and act on it. I mean, who loved the guy, right? The Samaritan yeah. loved him. Yeah. yeah. The non-religious nature of God created man. The non-religious nature of God created man. Was, was what you saw there.
Wow. And, and I'll send that to you, by the way. Uh, yeah. Uh, it, it, it's an eternal concept, by the way. Here's what else we know about the Good Samaritan. I know of nowhere where there's a law, a law named and the priest passed by on the other side. I know of nowhere there's a law named and the Levite looked on him and passed by on the other side. But I dare say in all 50 states in the United States, there's a good Samaritan law that says if you uh, if you stop to help somebody and do the best you can, you're not liable if you make a mistake. Right. There are RV centers all over the nation, all over the world called the Good Samaritan. I was on the board of a of an of a nonprofit that gave food and clothing and housing to people called the Good Samaritan Center. Here's a guy that didn't fit any of the qualifications, the orthodox qualifications, and yet. He's the guy. Jesus seemed to go out of his way to uh, uh, give the most stark picture of uh, contrast that he could. Uh, you know, the the uh, the woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery, the um, uh, the people that he chose as uh, disciples, um, uh, the good Samaritan. I mean, he he just uh, <laughs> he he had that ability, obviously, to uh, pick the greatest, show the greatest contrast that he possibly could. And, uh, I, I, somebody, I was listening to somebody yesterday who said, uh, you know, when you see something in the Bible that doesn't make sense, uh, God's probably trying to show you something that's way deeper than, <laughs> than what's just on the surface there. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, ain't that the truth? I'd never thought about it in exactly this phrase till right now, but Jesus in reality, is the ultimate example of the the non-religious nature of a God-created man. Hmm. Yeah. Well, that's something to think about and listen to Jesus tell us more about, isn't it? Yeah. Yeah. He. Uh, uh, yeah. He was. He was never accused of being religious, was he? <laughs> no. I wrote a, a blog post called uh, "No Self-Respecting Church" that outlines all the reasons that Jesus would not be ex uh, would not be acceptable in a re in a self-respecting church. I'll send that to you if you'd like. Yeah, uh, yeah, I appreciate it. Uh, I mean, the, the list goes on. I mean, who he hung out with? Good grief! His cousin, who pronounced him, was beheaded for for what he preached. Yeah, uh, his, his mother was pregnant out of wedlock. The church leaders would have killed her if they'd known that. Yeah. Uh, his first religious act was to sit and correct the elders when he was 12 years old. And his second one was to make wine so they could have a big party. <laughs> uh, I mean, the list of totally unacceptable things of Jesus never ends from, yeah. from, from, from the first word. I mean, he was, he was an illegal alien. He, yeah. he, he the, from before his birth, he was totally unacceptable. Yeah. To, to the to the stereotype yeah so bob these these things that the that the holy spirit is showing us and uh and obviously uh since i've spent time with you i, I see that in spades but um it, it's one thing to i mean it, it's 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 nice and it's good to get that uh understanding and see uh the deeper truths of of uh, spiritual things, um, but then, like with the with the Good Samaritan, um, and and this isn't a, a loaded question. I'm not looking for a specific answer. I'm, I'm looking for uh, uh, information for myself and for our listeners and watchers. Then, what do we do with that information? How do we help? Uh, how do we uh, do what Jesus did, going around doing good? Uh, how do we use what we know and the things that the Lord has shown us? How do what, what the uh, what do we do with that? How do we help people with that? Each one of us has some gathering, some 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 medium, some way we communicate with people. It may be through our business. It may be through a church. It may, it, in my case, it's through social media. Uh, The first thing we do, it, it, the example of Jesus was that everybody he saw, he looked for their need. He did not condescendingly. He just looked at them. And, and, and if there was a clear need there, 
I think of the I think of the lame man at the pool of Bethesda, who'd been sitting there waiting for the waters to be troubled. And uh, Jesus went up to him and said, "Would you be healed?" I mean, here's a guy with an obvious problem, and 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 Jesus' action was, "I see an obvious situation here." And I think I can help you. Would, would you like me to do that? He didn't say, you need to be healed or be healed. He said, would you be healed? Are, are you willing? There's a great saying that when the, when the student is ready, the teacher will appear. When the student is truly ready, the teacher will disappear, right? That there's, a, mm-hmm. there's a time in, in our interaction with people, if we'll be sensitive to them, that there's an opening not to evangelize them, not to try to get them to say a prayer or, or get them to join an organization or whatever. There's, there's always going to be opportunity to, in sometimes in very small ways, to make their day better. You know, Jesus said, I came that you might have life and that more abundantly. I, I was in a, a board meeting uh, one time in a, a, a breakout board meeting, a, a retreat in a nonprofit that I was working with, uh, uh, that I was a board member of. And the young lady got up and said, do any of you have a mission statement? And I got one immediately. And my mission statement in life is to improve the life of all those that participate. Mm. Now, how's that done? It, it, it may be remembering the name of the young lady that I called at Mass Street, Mass Street uh, 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 Beverages today, uh, yesterday to, uh, to get her to put together a case of root beer for me and calling her by name when I interact with her. It may be, and I do this habitually, it may be as I get off the phone saying, be blessed. And that can mean a whole lot of different things to a whole lot of people, but nobody's offended by it. Uh, it, it, may be, it may be in a situation where you have to call customer service because you've got a problem with something. And, and it may be a bad problem. It may be something and you're not getting satisfaction in it. When I get to that point, I'll say to them in a very pleasant voice, could I be treated like an, like an irate customer without having to be a jerk? <laughs> they always laugh, by the way, you know, because I've, I've done some, just, just a pleasantry sometimes is your opportunity. Now, as you interact with people, some people are going to get curious about you. Where did that come from? Uh, there's always opportunity to say, I don't, it doesn't matter whether you're religious or not. I came to have, give life and that more abundantly is just a good idea. It had anything to do with <laughs> anything to do with, with with being religious. It's just if everybody did that, how much better world would there would there, would there be? Yeah. And 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 and, and so uh, Flo and I were Flo and I worked the streets in Atlanta in '96 in the in the during the Olympics for a week. We stayed in a in a in a, in a Church of God church camp and and took the took the Marta uh, the the uh, 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 Marta in every day and walked the streets handing out. On one side, we had a had a map of the Olympics that the security guys told us was the best map they'd seen. And on the other, we didn't put it together, by the way, we just handed it out. On the other side, it had the gospel, a simple gospel in three languages. And on the way to do that, driving to Atlanta, uh, I passed a truck hauling some big hay bales and, 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 and it was from out of state. And I knew that there'd been a, some, some really dry weather down in that area. And I knew that farmers were, were where it was wet and where they had a crop, they were taking hay to farmers that didn't have it, mm. hay, that, mm-hmm. that needed it. But the Lord said to me, what this thing you're doing is, is really good. But come and harvest your own field. See, if all you're doing is rolling hay up and going somewhere else to help somebody else and somewhere else, you're going you're gonna to go broke. Uh, we have around us a field, a fertile field of people and opportunity. And if we realize that every one of those persons is a facet of God, I, 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 I was years ago when I first started blogging, I, I, I did a blog on, on this rock while I built my church. And I'd always thought of that rock as being granite or some great stone. What I realized what it was, it was a diamond. Mm. And a diamond has many facets. Mm. And if we'll look upon each person that we meet, as our brother or sister, just like we talked about last week, mm-hmm. and and see them as 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 an image of God, just like we're an image of God, and God made man in His own image. And by the way, four verses later, didn't say it's good. He said this is very good. Yeah. I 
I, how much, how good is God's very good? I, I try to imagine <laughs> that sometimes. But if we'll look upon people that way, we can't help but minister to them. We're going to love them because they're our brother or sister. And, and if we're sensitive to them, I, I guarantee you that spirit that, that is in our DNA that wants, by the way, just like Jesus wants to, wants to minister to those people. He didn't ask people to say the sinner's prayer. He didn't tell them to repent. He didn't make demands on them. He didn't put together an organization and a church board. What he did was he, he recognized what made the, might, might make their life better at that moment. The woman at the wall, I love that you brought her up last week, uh, uh, wrote a blog post about that called Neither Do I Condemn You. Say it again. Look, Neither do I condemn you. Neither do I condemn you. If you look at what he did there, he first of all, he defied the law of Moses. Mm -hmm. He defied the crowd. He, uh, he looked at a real situation that was not good. Uh, we don't know. By the way, they say they caught her in the very act of adultery. Where's the guy? Yeah. I mean, you know, there's all kinds of things. But what he did there was everything he did there was classic Jesus. And the only thing you could do was either either start following this guy around or walk off and drop your rock and walk off because it was just overwhelming and it, the, the examples are, are 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 everywhere of that. And that we have that opportunity every day we have that opportunity 10 times a day i've been on phone conversations today in business that gave me that opportunity mm -hmm. i'll be on another one after we talk today and i'll have an opportunity i i this is a guy that i do a lot of business with I, I know about his, I know he has a stepson that's coming in that just crossed one year of AA successfully. Uh, I, I know that his wife is concerned about that. I honestly care about that. I'll honestly ask about that. I'm not trying to hustle the guy for business. He's doing business with me, hmm. but, but he's not just some guy that does business with me. He is a, he is a walking, talking facet of the almighty God that I'm talking to. And Indeed. why wouldn't I want to, participate in speaking to that man and blessing him and he blesses me i mean yeah uh, 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 there, there's there's an overwhelming abundance of blessing out there all we have to do is tap into it when when jesus created wine by the way it's very interesting to get the wedding he not only did he create more than they could drink which interestingly enough he did it in the holy water labors <laughs> he uh he, uh, he, he, he completely changed the tables on it. Jesus always had an abundance. When he fed the 5,000, there was food left. Yeah. Uh, it's out of that abundance, by the way, that goes back to love your neighbor as you love yourself. You've got to love yourself. You've got to understand that you aren't depraved. You've got to understand that you are a marvelous creation of the Almighty God. Yeah. And, 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 and you are loved. And, and, there is so much love in you that if you'll just allow it, it'll just wash out all over everybody. And I don't know anybody that doesn't want to be loved. I've never met anybody that doesn't yeah. want to be loved. No kidding. Yeah. That's so much wisdom and all that. In case you noticed that every time I uh, turn my head over here, I'm writing down notes from, uh, <laughs> from what you're saying. And uh, uh, probably next week in some of my teaching, I'll say, well, my good friend, Bob Ingle said this and, then after a few weeks, I'll say, well, you know, it's always been said. And after a few months, I'll say, well, I've always said <laughs> that, that's the kind of way. Uh, <laughs> if you say it enough, I heard if, it, if you say it 10 times, you don't have to attribute it anymore. It's yours. Yeah, <laughs> yeah probably so. Uh, well, Bob, we, this has been another great time and we're getting ready to, to close up now. And uh, you have uh uh, work in your business to do, and I have my things to do for the rest of the day, but we're going to, uh, these will come up, uh, well, when people hear these, uh, it'll be a little while after we recorded them, but they, as you always say, be blessed, and they will be blessed indeed by this. So as, as we finish, tell people how they can be blessed by connecting with you. How can they find you uh, online and those things? Well, if you'll find me on Facebook, it's Bob Engel, and I live in Lawrence, Kansas, and you'll see a picture of Flo and me on, on the cover and, and, and uh, on, on our wall, and, and, uh, and send me a friend request. I, I'd, be, I'd, I'd love to get to know you. Uh, uh, you can find the blog if you want to at Unheard Words. That's Unheard Words is one word that ends with a Z, not an S, so it's unheardwords.com. 
you can find my music out on Bandcamp. It's just Bob Engel on Bandcamp. And uh, uh, my email address, by the way, is I am Bengal at Gmail. Uh, I was name dropping there, the I am, right? <laughs> um, That's your name and my uh, name and everybody exactly, else's. <laughs> exactly. It's exactly right. And, and I, I, I got it on Gmail, believe it or not. <laughs> uh, but, but reach out to me. Uh, I, I want to know you. Uh, if you feel led to reach out to me, you probably have something for me. You, you probably have something to minister to me. And maybe I have something to minister to you. But uh, I, I, I wel welcome a connection with you. As you said early on, by the way, religious trolls not qualified, but there's a lot of people out there that think they're trolling that are just looking for answers. Yeah, that's true. And, and uh, 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 boy, if Jesus hadn't taken the religious trolls under his uh, under his wing, we'd all be in trouble. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> right? so, yeah, that's for sure. Re reach out to me, people. I I'd love to get to know you. Uh, I'm not selling anything. I'm not going to ask you for anything, except I'd like for you to love me, and I'd like to love you back. Amen to that. Well, Bob, stay on the stay on the line. You and I'll visit just a little bit to wrap this up. But thank you again for being with us. And I know you're sincere in what you just said because that's that's what happened to me. I found out about you and reached out to you, and you know, right away we started uh, communicating. So I I know uh, anybody who who uh, does want to connect with you, they'll they'll find a real treat, and they, indeed they will be blessed. So, Bob, thanks again. Uh, we'll do this again another time. And to everybody that uh, that's been listening, appreciate you all. Uh, I'll say, grow in grace, and Bob, you will say, be blessed. <laughs> I knew you would say that. Yeah. <laughs> thanks, everybody. Love you all. See you next time.